Good morning. I'm Lake Nelson. Thanks for coming to the Data Colada seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ioannis Evangelidis. In addition, we're joined by a set of panelists that are all going to be great. That's Mina Jung, Alice Moon, Tali Reich, Irene Skopeliti, and Oleg Erminsky. Uh, in addition to all of them, Yuri Simonson is with us as well today. Joe Simmons is busy giving a talk at another university and will not be with us, uh, but he is with us in spirit. For those of you who haven't done this before, uh, if you have any questions or comments along the way during the presentation, you can submit them through the Q&A function. They can be read by all of us, and if we have a chance, we will give voice to those questions to, to Giannis directly. If we don't, don't worry, they all get recorded and he'll be able to see them after the end of the talk anyway. So still useful, even if you're not necessarily expressing it. Cool, uh, I think those are all the details. So Giannis, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Lick. let me share my screen. All right, um, thank you for inviting me. And um, today's talk is actually uh, new for me because the first time I present this paper in front of a live audience, which is great. Um, and uh, this paper is something I started working on during the pandemic. And it's one of the few papers I worked on my own uh, entirely. So I'm curious to uh, hear any questions, any thoughts you have. Uh, the paper was uh, recently accepted. It's uh, forthcoming at uh, JP General uh, and the talk is largely based on that paper. Uh, so most of the studies I'll present are based on that paper. Uh, okay, so this paper is about uh, diminishing sensitivity. And I'm pretty sure we have a uh, hardcore JDM audience here. So you guys know what the evening sensitivity is, um, but I'll give you uh, a brief introduction to the concept. Uh, going back to Weber studies back in the 1800s, uh, the idea is that uh, people's ability to differentiate between stimuli uh, decreases as the stimuli uh, background or size becomes larger. What do I mean by that? The way I explain this to my uh, MBA students uh, when we talk about this idea uh, in my classes is that uh, imagine you have a person and you ask them, uh, hold these two weights and the weight on the left uh, weighs 100 grams and the weight on the right weighs 110 grams. And you ask that person to make a judgment, which one of these two weights is heavier? Now, typically most people can tell that the one on the right, that's 110 grams, is heavier than the one on the left. Now, uh, in another trial, you ask the same person to hold these two weights and now one of them, the one on the left is one kilo, so a thousand uh, grams, the one on the right is a uh, one kilo plus 10 grams. And here you ask the person the same question, uh, which of these two weights is heavier? Now what happens is that typically most people have a hard time telling which one is heavier. So our ability to differentiate between these two stimuli uh, decreases as the stimuli become uh, larger as we call it magnitude or the background increases. So the same 10 gram difference uh, feels uh, less uh, easy to discern when the stimuli are larger in this case. So that's how uh, the immunity sensitivity was uh, tested uh, in the psychophysics world uh, in the 1800s and later. And uh, the immunity sensitivity uh, is a big, uh, of course, uh, concept has been tested in all sorts of perceptual stimuli using, for example, uh, taste or uh, uh, audio or uh, any of the five senses that you can imagine. And the immunity sensitivity also became a big uh, concept in choice. And uh, in choice, we uh, often uh, use it, in, for, for example, in prospect theory, we say that the impact of the difference in two amounts decreases as we go further away from the reference point. So this is how a value function looks in the example of gains. Uh, so what does this mean? How have we brought this idea to the uh, choice world? Uh, so the idea, which is reflecting prospect theory's value function, is that uh, the pleasure of moving from, let's say, zero dollars to a thousand dollars in the domain of gains is larger than the pleasure of moving from $1,000 to $2,000. And similarly, the pleasure of moving from $1,000 to $2,000 is larger than the pleasure of moving from $2,000 to $3,000. So the idea is as the same difference in magnitude feels uh, smaller or gives us less pleasure as we move further away from zero. And uh, that's also reflected in prospect theory value for uh, value function for losses. So the pain of moving from zero to minus 1,000 is larger than the pain of moving from minus 1,000 to minus 2,000. And similarly, the pain of moving from minus 1,000 to minus 2,000 is larger than the pain of moving from minus 2,000 to minus 3,000. Uh, so we know this. Uh, uh, it has become kind of canonical in the decision-making world that uh, this happens. And um, what I want to do today is kind of challenge this idea. And I want to go a bit, take a step back and reflect a bit on how have we test this idea of diminishing sensitivity in the choice world. So I'm not going to 
say that diminished accessibility doesn't exist, it clearly exists, but I'm gonna make the point that the way it has been tested in psychophysics is not exactly the same with the way it's been tested in uh, choice environments. And uh, that is important because uh, it kind of affects, it kind of gives us this illusion that we have diminished sensitivity in choice that is kind of the same as in it, it is in the perceptual world. And I'm gonna make the point that's actually not true. Um, so uh, the point I wanna make is that the extent to which people exhibit diminished sensitivity or the extent to which we as researchers, as ADM researchers think that people exhibit diminished sensitivity uh, can depend on how we test uh, for diminished sensitivity. There are different methodologies that we can use and I'll discuss this uh, today. There are two main methodologies in which, uh, by which you can test for diminishing sensitivity. And depending on which one you use, you can uh, derive different conclusions and different interpretations of people's choice behavior. And that's the general point I wanna make and I'm making this paper. Um, so let me make this more concrete. So one classic way we have tested for diminishing sensitivity uh, in the JDM world and in most papers uh, on decision-making and the risk is for example, by giving people two uh, options and asking them to make a choice. Uh, here's one example of that. So you have A, 100% chance to, to win or gain uh, $3,000. B, 50% chance uh, to gain 2,000 and 50% chance to gain uh, 4,000. Now, uh, if I ask you, which one uh, do you think most people choose? I'm sure most of you will say A, all right? So if uh, most of you have read the papers or have done any studies on this topic, uh, Here's the data from 200 people that I asked on uh, Prolific, if I'm not mistaken. And 80% of the people choose A and 20% of the people choose B. All right. Uh, and the idea here is that we can use this choice, this result, to uh, make a judgment about whether people exhibit diminishing sensitivity to outcomes. So the typical conclusion uh, that people draw from this type of uh, decisions is that people's choices in this example are consistent with diminishing sensitivity. Because it seems you can argue that the pleasure of moving from 3,000 to 4,000 is smaller than the pleasure of moving from 2,000 to 3,000. So uh, essentially, even uh, if people have no uh, inherent risk preferences, the fact that I win 100% chance to win 3,000, uh, I prefer it because the movement from 2,000 to 3,000 is much yields much more utility to me than the movement from 3,000 to 4,000. Um, one issue, however, with trying to say, uh, to make a judgment about whether people exhibit diminished sensitivity using these independent choices, is that in reality, uh, we don't know if, uh, the choices appear to be consistent with diminished sensitivity, but there are also other explanations. Uh, for example, in this case, it could be that people derive the same utility when they move from 2,000 to 3,000, and the same utility when they move from 3,000 to 4,000. Uh, but what happens is that people simply have a preference for a certain gain over a risky prospect, all right? So they like knowing that 100% chance to win 3,000 uh, is feels much better to me. I just prefer, uh, that's basically my risk preference. So what the point I wanna make is that with this type of independent choices, it's hard to say uh, to what extent diminishing sensitivity drives choice behavior. Uh, the, the data feel consistent here with diminishing sensitivity, but we don't know to what extent it is diminishing sensitivity or risk preferences driving this result. Uh, so the general point I wanna make is that it's another methodology that you can use to test for diminishing sensitivity uh, that kind of gives you a more clear picture to what extent people actually ex exhibit diminishing sensitivity to outcomes. Uh, so if I was only looking at this choice, that's how potentially I would uh, uh, draw the value function. And you can see here, for example, uh, as you move from 1,000 to 2,000, uh, the return in value that you get is larger than when you move from 2,000 to 3,000. And then when you move from 3,000 to 4,000, the return in value becomes even smaller. So based on this choice result, I could possibly have this type of value function in my head. It doesn't mean you have to actually uh, apply it, but uh, that's kind of what the data seem to suggest. All right. So the point I want to make is there's another way to test for the diminishing sensitivity, and the results will not look exactly the same. So what is that methodology? What is this approach? Um, so the second approach is a bit more uh, complicated. And in this case, you have to have a system of choices, a series of choices where you manipulate the size of the outcomes. And the important thing here being that everything else is held constant. So the probabilities are held constant and the absolute differences between the outcomes are held constant. And that's exactly the way it's been done in the world of psychophysics where uh, I showed you the example of the weights. Uh, the weights become larger by the difference uh, between the weights is held constant. And uh, if you do this, 
given that any other factor is held constant between the stimuli, any systematic variation in people's preferences across the different choices uh, can only be traced back to the changes in the uh, magnitude of the outcomes. And I'll show you how a study like that would look like. Uh, so the idea being here is that you can have a series of choices. You change only uh, the magnitude of the outcomes, differences and probabilities stay the same. And then this is basically allowing you to uh, directly assess to what extent people, people's choices uh, exhibit diminished sensitivity by comparing the choices across uh, a series of decisions. That's the general point I want to make. So um, going uh, here, this is how a study will look like. This is a study actually run with 800 people, pre-registered, uh, everything, uh, data posted already. So I'll talk about this later. Uh, so here, people were randomly assigned to one of four conditions. And in the first condition, and uh, apologies, I didn't have any great labels for the conditions. So I call them condition one, two, three, four, also in the paper. Uh, I couldn't find something better. Um, so in condition number one, people are choosing between 100% chance to gain 1,000 versus 50% chance to gain nothing and 50% chance to gain 2,000. Condition number two, you have 100% chance to gain 2,000, 50% chance to gain 1,000, and 50% chance to gain 3,000. Condition number three, 100% chance to gain uh, 3,000 and 50% uh, chance to gain 2,000 versus 50% chance to gain 4,000. Condition number four, 100% chance to gain 4,000, 50% chance to gain 3,000, and 50% chance to gain 5,000. So what you see here is that you move from condition one to condition four, uh, the outcomes increase by a constant uh, $1,000. And the idea here being that um, since we're moving further away from the reference point of zero, uh, we know that people, first of all, are gonna prefer the certain prospect, but people should become increasingly indifferent between the two amounts as you get further away from zero, right? That's the idea. So in condition one, we presume that many people, uh, the vast majority will prefer A over B. And that difference will become smaller as you move from condition one to condition two, condition three and condition four. So the preference for A will be higher in condition A, in condition one, and uh, decrease gradually to be the lowest in condition four. Not only that, if people exhibit diminished sensitivity, um, the difference between condition one and condition two should be larger than the difference between condition two and three. And the difference between condition two and three should be larger than the difference between condition three and four. Uh, so that's the way uh, choices should look like if you have diminishing sensitivity uh, to these amounts. Yeah, Nessa, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you, <clears throat> will all your examples involve risky choice to, in the uh, paper? No, I'll, I'll talk about six different domains. So I'll start with risky choice and then extend to uh, okay. explicit choice right. as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's actually a paper that I study many different domains, uh, but I start with risky choice. Okay, so let's have a look at how this uh, data uh, look like in this experiment. So condition one, uh, it's what you would expect. The vast majority, 92% of the people prefer A and only 6.5% prefer B. So what happens to the other conditions? Um, as you would expect in condition two, fewer people prefer A. So 82% of the people prefer A and 18% uh, of the people prefer B. Now, uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, once you move to conditions three and four, the choices look largely the same. So there is a very small uh, decrease in this uh, study when you go from two to three and from three to four, these differences are not significant. So essentially uh, the choices of people don't look uh, vastly different between conditions two, three, and four. And the only condition that uh, is different from the others is condition number one, which means that essentially people are mostly sensitive to the presence versus absence of a gain. So in condition one, if you choose A, you can avoid the possibility of not winning anything. So in that condition, people are particularly sensitive uh, uh, to um, taking any risk. And then once you move to conditions two, three, or four, choices look largely the same. So uh, it seems that sensitivity of people drops quite fast here. And people are mostly sensitive to the presence versus absence of uh, the games. So um, I want to mention something here, going back, comparing the two methodologies, you can derive different conclusions. So if you look at the first uh, example, the vast majority prefer a certain gain of 3,000 over a gamble with 50% chance of winning 2,000 and a 50% chance of winning 4,000. And if you just look at this result alone, if you were to run this study alone or this choice alone, you would say uh, that it's likely that people exhibit this municipal sensitivity because um, the pleasure of moving from 2,000 to 3,000 is larger than the pleasure of moving from 3,000 to 4,000. 
And that's not uh, an inference I make. I've seen this similar interpretations of single choicers in the literature, and I have some examples here. Um, however, if you look at the study I just showed you with the series of choices, uh, participants are not significantly less likely to prefer a share gain of 3,000 over a gamble with a 50% chance of winning 2,000 and a 50% chance of winning 4,000 than they are to prefer a share gain of 2,000 over a gamble with a 50% chance of winning uh, 1,000 and 50% chance of winning 3,000. So what does this mean? Based on this result, the pleasure of moving from 2,000 to 3,000 does not appear to be larger than the pleasure of moving from 3,000 to 4,000. And that's the general point I want to make is that uh, once you uh, start testing for diminishing sensitivity using this series of choices, holding everything else constant and just changing uh, the uh, size of the outcomes, you will probably get uh, a value function that looks like that. So people are mostly sensitive to the presence versus absence of outcomes and are rather insensitive to the scope of the outcomes when the latter differ from zero. So this, uh, uh, I call it the rapidly diminishing sensitivity function, which is basically a value function that flattens very fast as you move away from zero. Uh, I, didn't, I couldn't come up with a better name. Um, so that's uh, what the uh, value function that I propose looks like when you test for diminishing sensitivity using this system of choices, I call it, or this series of choices, uh, holding everything else constant. Um, question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So in terms of how rapid the diminishing sensitivity is, do you have thoughts about loss versus gains? Because in the paper, you kind of treat them the same. And I'm wondering if we should expect that to look the same or if one is more rapid than the other. Like, what are, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, uh, the next study I'll show you has losses. Uh, so I try to replicate the exact same thing using losses uh, to see if it's kind of like, uh, is it robust to both? Does it differ in marketing? Doesn't seem to differ. Uh, so let me uh, go a few slides from now. I'll show you how it works out with losses, but it's kind of the same result that you would expect. Uh, Alice, you have a question? Yeah, uh, could I just ask, um, you know, you say that it's rapidly diminishing, but I thought the amounts that you're using are still pretty big, especially potentially for online samples. Do you use like smaller amounts at all? Uh, so in this uh, risky prospects, unfortunately, I didn't have uh, smaller amounts, but in other settings that I saw, for example, product choices or moral decisions or like um, um, uh, intertemporal choices, I have smaller amounts. Uh, but I, I don't want to make the point that sensitivity decreases exactly after zero. Uh, so that's a point uh, I want to be uh, clear about. It could be that it doesn't decrease immediately after zero, right? Uh, it could be that, for example, you find some sort of diminishing sensitivity if you use like 100 or 200. Uh, but the point I want to make is that these two different methodologies for the same amount, right, can give you different conclusions, okay? Uh, but I'm not going to make the point that people become insensitive immediately the moment you step out of zero. Uh, that's a very big point to make, and I want to uh, step a bit away from that. Although, I'll show you some evidence that for some domains, that happens exactly the moment you leave uh, zero, but I wouldn't want to make this point about all the domains, okay? And he, clearly not here. Great, uh, I want to be a bit careful, yeah. Um, Jonas, All right. Just a yeah. quick clarification. When you when you're talking about diminishing sensitivity to amount, is that the same thing as diminishing marginal utility? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it's from the chat. <laughs> it's from the chat. All right. Yeah. Oh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess it is. Uh, so, if we're talking about the difference in outcomes, uh, there is a decreasing marginal utility in uh, how this. Uh, uh, difference in outcomes translates to your to the value that you derive. So yeah, I guess you can think about it like that. Um, all right. So uh, what is the point I want to make? Um, put simply, uh, and I like this. This is not my idea. It's how one of the reviewers in the JP Journal put it. Uh, you put simply, for uh, lay people, people seem to particularly avoid the absence of positive outcomes, particularly seek the absence of negative outcomes, and do not respond much to changes in outcomes when those are always present. Uh, so that's how you can think about the results in more simple terms, all right? And that's a result, a pattern that you will get consistently if you test for diminishing sensitivity with a series of choices. That's the point I want to make. Um, I have a lot of studies. Uh, I started with the, with the one on financial gains, have also uh, losses. Then I'll talk about other domains like loss of human life, product choices, adjustments of goal-related performance, and the temporal decisions and moral choices. And I'll use some um, stimuli from prominent papers that most of you probably are familiar with. Um, all right, so in the interest of time, let me proceed. I'll talk about financial losses. This is exactly the same study as you saw before, but in the domain of losses. Uh, so you have condition one, 100% chance to lose 1,000 versus 50% chance to lose nothing, 50% chance to uh, lose 2,000. 
Condition number two, a uh, 100% chance to lose uh, 2,000 versus 50% chance minus 1,000, 50% chance minus 3,000, and so forth. All right, so you see it's the same idea. Uh, the losses increase by uh, 1,000 as you go from condition one to condition four. So you would expect uh, that uh, predominantly people here are risk-seeking, so they prefer B over A, and uh, possibly they become increasingly indifferent between the two options as you go from condition one to condition four. So they should prefer more B in condition one. And uh, that preference for B should uh, decrease gradually as you go to condition four. Um, so let me show you how the data look like. And uh, in this condition one, 73% of the people choose B and 27% of the people choose A. And once you move to condition two, uh, that share drops. So you have 62.7 of the people, 62.5 uh, choose B, 37.5 choose A, and there is not much different with the other conditions. In fact, there is no more uh, real change. Uh, so it seems again that people are particularly sensitive to the presence versus absence of a loss. They particularly seek the absence of a loss, uh, and that's possible in condition one, where if you take the risky choice, the risky option, you can potentially avoid the loss. Um, and don't react much to changes in the uh, magnitude of the outcomes uh, once losses are certain. So once you move essentially to conditions three, two, three, and four, all right? Um, so that's uh, the same kind of result. And it looks in magnitude kind of the same as in gains, uh, maybe a bit smaller actually. Okay, uh, let me uh, show you some other studies on different domains uh, since Yuri asked. So this is a study on the loss of human life and I use this uh, classic, uh, uh, study everyone uh, is familiar with, with the unusual disease. Um, I'm not using the original label for obvious reasons. And then two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed and assume that the exact scientific estimate of the consequence of the programs are as follows. Uh, and you see here condition one is essentially the same as the one in uh, Tversky in Panama 1981. So if program A is adopted, 400 people will die. If program B is adopted, there's one uh, out of three probability that no one will die and essentially uh, two out of three probability that 600 people will die. And what you see here, as you move from condition one to conditions two, three, and four, uh, the outcomes increase by 100, all right? So uh, for example, in condition two, uh, program A entails uh, a death count of 500 people, and B, uh, there is one third probability that 100 people will die and two thirds probability that 700 people will die. Um, and then you see condition three, 600, uh, Condition four, 700 for the uh, certain option. Now, um, this is the first study I ran, and that's why it's a bit underpowered. I tried to run with 100 people per cell. It wasn't a great idea. Um, but uh, I also didn't use choice. I used the uh, bipolar rating. So in this uh, study, people were asked to uh, express their preference using a rating scale with a slider, and zero being a strongly preferred program B, program B being uh, the risky uh, option, and uh, 100 being I strongly prefer program A, okay? So we know from the classic study that people overly prefer program B um, in the domain of losses. And the idea here being that preference for B should be stronger in condition one and should gradually decrease as you go to conditions two, three, and four if people exhibit immunity sensitivity. Uh, but if people are mostly sensitive to the presence versus absence of losses, uh, we would expect that people's preference for B will be particularly pronounced in condition one where there is a possibility that you can avoid the losses totally because uh, there's a one third chance no one will die. And people will be insensitive to the changes in outcomes between conditions two, three, and four. So conditions two, three, and four may look the same uh, if we extrapolate from the previous results. Um, and that's how the data look like. So uh, indeed in condition one, there's the strongest preference for B and the other three conditions look kind of the same again. So there's no real difference between them. Uh, so people seem to be particularly sensitive to the presence versus absence of this uh, uh, loss, the possibility to lose human life, not so much to the changes in magnitudes once you move further away from zero. Um, so I have some more. I tried to extrapolate this finding after these first few studies uh, on different domains, one being product choices. Yeah. Um, Can I and... ask a quick on the yeah. study that you just showed yeah. maybe maybe yeah. like you're going to a different domain so that's gonna uh, make it interesting but i find it really striking that uh you show to some extent that risk preferences are consistent and scope insensitive uh, do you think uh this is like evidence that 
um, risk preferences may reflect some um, higher order preference that trump than the evaluation of the prospect, or uh, that's uh, really out of place. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's so what, what do you have in mind? Can you maybe elaborate a bit more? Because maybe I'm not following your point 100%. So I find it very interesting that people completely neglect the magnitude of the outcome, but show the exact same. And I think the, the means here and the shares were very similar uh, across the different scenarios, even in the, like in the, in the within subjects study. Uh, so both for losses and for gains. So it seems that people don't uh, assess fully, maybe because of the lack of relativity and because the ratio, but sorry, the, yeah. the relative comparison between the magnitude of the expected value and the yeah. certain so that's one uh, you may find surprising I, I think there are many people who don't find it surprising because uh, you can say there's we know about scope insensitivity uh, and for example we know that if you ask people to do a donate to save 2,000 birds or 20,000 birds or 200,000 birds they kind of uh, say the same um, and I mentioned this in the paper I'm like this is not new uh, and it seems to arise when you have this type of studies where you manipulate between choices the magnitude of the outcome so I want to trace it to that um, I don't find it so surprising uh, I find it more surprising about how much we think diminishing sensitivity matters uh, rather than the to me scope sensitivity seems much more natural in this type of scenario so I was not very surprised to see that people just are more sensitive to the zero right um, yeah. But yeah, I, I guess it's a topic for discussion. That's like uh, uh, people maybe have because, different priors. Yeah, 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 maybe because there's not a very small, um, very small outcomes. Uh, so they're all relatively big, as Alice said. Uh, maybe. maybe. Maybe that could be one of the factors. But yeah, <laughs> okay. Could, could, could be, could be. Um, so in other studies that I'll have later, there are smaller outcomes. Um, all right. Let me go to the product choices. Um, and these studies are based on this paper by, uh, ah, Oli, you have a question? I just had a follow-up question to that. So just taking these results on their own, they could be explained by complete scope insensitivity for large amounts, but I think they could also be consistent with a kind of a discontinuity at zero and then linear, right? Yeah, yeah. I think... The way I think it works, like there's a discontinuity at zero and then a very weak linear. For the most studies, there seems to be a weak linear uh, slope, uh, which in my case, most of the times, not, uh, I can't exclude zero with this test that I'm running. Um, but if you were to power on the thousands, maybe there's a very small slope. Because in some cases, you see that there is some small difference uh, between the three conditions, uh, not in every study though. But this, the difference between the conditions when none of the options are zero, the difference between the conditions is a measure of curvature, not of slope of the, not of slope. Isn't that right? Yeah. If you're comparing in pairs, you're basically saying if the beta uh, comparing the two groups is zero or not, right? That's the null hypothesis that the, uh, let's say the slope is zero versus not uh, between two groups, not of the whole, because I'm never running the whole um, studies together. So I'm comparing every time two groups. Um, yeah, so in most cases, I cannot exclude that it's zero, but uh, I've seen some of it is like the first study I saw, there seems to be some weak linear trend that if you were, for example, to power it up and run uh, many cells, probably you would find like a small difference from zero. Yeah. Um, although, for example, if you go to this previous one, like there is no li linear trend because, for example, condition two is higher than three and then four is higher uh, than three. So it's kind of weird. Um, but what but I was saying was not the linear trend across those last three bars. But mm -hmm. assume that the last th that conditions two through four are identical. Yeah. Couldn't that come from a utility function that oh, is okay. perfectly linear? But maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed your comment. Yeah, that, that would come. That, that come. would come. Yeah, I missed your comment. That's perfectly fine. So it's kind of like an uh, an expected value type of thing, or uh, where there is no transformation, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that could be possible for sure. Um, Okay, let me show you more data, which I love doing. Um, so uh, I have a few more studies, and this is with product choices, uh, and it's based on uh, the marketing science paper of uh, Sapanieri, Mozart, and Ariely. And it's actually a paper that kind of inspired this um, research to some extent, because uh, it's the first paper that I read that I realized that uh, they have this result, which seems to suggest that it's continuity around zero. They discuss it first. Uh, I'm not the first person to discuss it, and I'm not gonna take credit for that. And I noticed that this experimental design they were using is very similar to the one I showed you just now and to the one I've seen in other papers that I will discuss at the end. Uh, 
So that's kind of generated the idea uh, as a first paper. There are two papers that kind of did that. I'll show you another one later. All right, so uh, imagine you're in a supermarket that's having special deals for the day, and they offer two chocolates, both in good condition. Um, and this is uh, the study, and these are the stimuli. There are four cells, and people are choosing between a Hershey's and a Lind. Uh, in condition one, uh, the Hershey's is uh, priced at zero, and the Lind is priced at one. Uh, condition two, uh, the price have increased by 10 cents. Uh, if you read the classic uh, paper by uh, Sapani et al, they have also difference between uh, of one cent, so they increase by one cent at a time. In my study, it's by ten. Uh, condition three: uh, the price of Hershey's is twenty cents and Lind one point two. Uh, condition four: the price of Hershey's is thirty cents. The price of Lind is one dollar thirty cents. Um, so the idea here being that uh, pain uh, is painful. And in condition one, you can avoid pain, so you can avoid this uh, loss. Uh, so people should overly prefer Hershey's over Lind. And the preference for Hershey's uh, should decrease when you go to condition two. Uh, and if people uh, start becoming less sensitive to the price difference between the options, uh, then uh, the preference for Hershey's should be the weakest uh, in condition four. All right? So you should see this gradual decrease in preference for Hershey's over Lind. Uh, so let's look at the data. Uh, so in condition one, um, 81.5% of the people prefer the Hershey's and 185 prefer the Lind. Um, in condition two, 68% of the people prefer the Hershey's and 32% uh, choose the Lind, which is what you would expect. Uh, but then the other two conditions, you see uh, a further decrease in condition three, 63.6% prefer Hershey's and 36.4% prefer the Lind. And in condition four, 66.2% prefer uh, uh, Hershey's and 33.8% uh, prefer the Lind. Uh, the truth is that uh, condition one differs from all the rest, but uh, the other difference between the two conditions are not uh, significant. And in fact, in condition four, where you would expect that it would be even lower than condition three, it's not. Uh, so it's kind of like um, not really, people don't seem to react uh, much to the change in price uh, once you move further away from zero. That's also consistent with the original findings of the authors. This is a study that has simply more conditions than the original because they have four groups. And I want to examine basically how robust this result is. Uh, but you can think about it like uh, the original result replicates. Uh, and it's kind of the same pattern that you saw before, just using uh, product choices with prices. All right. So it's not, I want to make the point that this type of design, experimental design, is largely identical. And you manipulate the prices, uh, you manipulate uh, the uh, size of the price, the difference held constant, and you see that people are particularly sensitive to the zero as you move further away from that. Uh, people seem to be not really sensitive um, to the change. Or if you want to think like uh, Oleg said, you can have this expected, uh, <laughs> the linear uh, value function, which is uh, uh, perfectly consistent. Yeah. Dennis? <clears throat> yeah. Uri? Will, will you talk about the jacket calculator at some point or no? I will not talk about it. I haven't run anything. Why is that? What, what do you have in mind? I just keep, I mean, I mean and feel free to def def defer to this question, but for later. but. It seems like in all your designs, there is the, like zero is present and it plays a, a key role. But in, in some of the classic dimension sensitivity studies, like the Jack calculator, there is there's no meaningful zero. Yeah. And just like intuitively, if you think I'm going to give you $10 off a, a $30 item or $10 off a, a million dollar item, it does seem like people would feel differently about them. So I wonder, and feel free to just leave this for the end for the discussion, but how do you think of those kinds of studies that don't have this binary comparison whether it's a zero versus not? Um, yeah, I mean, this type of study, again, the jacket and calculator study, unless I'm wrong, they don't have a system of choices, right? You're talking about one study where uh, people are saying, you have the same discount, let's say $5 for a jacket or a calculator, and people overly prefer to drive to save it for the calculator, but not for the uh, jacket. But I don't know what would happen if you were, uh, having the same paradigm, you manipulate the prices of the jacket and the calculator by adding a constant and see how they change uh, across different amounts. Uh, so I haven't run a study like that to tell you what happens. Um, so I think we're kind of comparing again uh, different types of experimental designs. Um, but in the next slide that I'll show you, there is actually no zero per se. Um, so it's a kind of a different domain. Um, and um, it's a domain of uh, judgments of goal related performance. Uh, it's a classic paper by one of Oleg's. Uh, uh, colleagues, and it's one of my favorite papers too. Uh, it's about uh, diminishing sensitivity to goals. And uh, in this paper, uh, there are a bunch of scenario studies 
And I took one of the scenarios and adapted it to the uh, purpose of this uh, paper. Uh, so in uh, my study, people read four scenarios in a random order, uh, this is within subjects, about two actors, Charles and David, that are pursuing the personal fitness goals. The names are the same as in the original study, actually. And after reading each scenario, participants are asked to indicate which actor, Charles or David, would work harder to perform one final sit-up. Uh, let me show you how the studies uh, look like and how the scenario looks like, and it will become clear. Um, so uh, in the first choice, um, and the order of the choice is randomized, by the way, so it's not like people saw this first, and uh, it's always randomized uh, in the within subjects world. So Charles and David both follow workout plans that usually involve doing 25 sit-ups. And one day, Charles set a goal of performing 30 sit-ups. He finds himself very tired after performing 39 sit-ups. And at most, has the energy to perform one more. And David sets a goal of performing uh, 40 sit-ups, and he finds himself very tired after 39 of those. And at most, has the energy to perform one more. And uh, that's the same kind of design as in the original. And the question is, which one of these two uh, characters, Charles or David, is more likely to perform the final sit-up? Um, so the idea here being that, uh, as the authors argue of the original paper, David should be more likely to uh, do the uh, final sit-up because he's very close to completing his goal. So he's very sensitive to the movement towards 40. So if he's 39 sit-ups, I'll do one more, I achieve my goal. Uh, Charles has already achieved his goal. Uh, so it doesn't matter much if he does this additional sit-up. Um, so that's choice number one. I would expect a strong uh, choice of David. Um, choice number two, uh, it's kind of the same uh, as before, the only difference being that now, uh, essentially, we add 10 uh, sit-ups uh, to both characters. So you're reading here, they have the same exact goal. And uh, Charles finds himself very tired after performing 49 sit-ups. And at most, has the energy to perform one more. David has a goal of performing 40 sit-ups. And he finds himself very tired after performing 49. And at most, has the energy to perform one more. Um, so here, uh, the idea being that uh, when you go to choice two, both actors have achieved their goal, people should be uh, less uh, sensitive uh, to, this, uh, to the difference between the two actors. In fact, um, they should probably choose David less frequently than choice number one, where you have this movement towards achieving the goal. Uh, there are two more choices. Uh, there is also a choice where you add another 10 to the sit-ups, 59 for both. And choice number four, both actors have achieved 69 uh, sit-ups. Um, so now the question is, are people, uh, for sure they will choose David presumably more in the first choice when David's about to achieve uh, his goal. And do, does this choice of David decrease steadily as you move further away uh, from, uh, let's say 39 to 69 sit-ups? So once you move further away from the goal. Uh, note that the authors in the original paper argue that um, even in choices two, three, and four, even after both actors achieve their goal, uh, people should still be choosing uh, David more because uh, David is still closer to his goal than Charles. So for example, look at choice number four. Uh, David has a goal of doing 40 sit-ups and he's plus 29. So he's already done 69. Uh, Charles has done 30 sit-ups and uh, has a goal of 30 and he's already 39 sit-ups away from his goal. So in principle, David should still be preferred uh, in choice number four because he's closer to his goal. He still derives marginally more utility than Charles. Um, that's the point the authors make in the original paper. Uh, I don't focus so much on that, but I want to mention it here. All right, so um, this uh, is this uh, design. You have choice number one, 39 sit-ups, choice number two, 49, 59, 69 sit-ups. As you go to choice number four, um, as you would expect, most people choose David uh, for the first one because David is about to achieve his goal by doing one final sit-up. Um, and this uh, choice of David decreases uh, when you go to choice number two, when both uh, Charles and David have achieved their goal. And there are no real differences uh, with the other groups. And one thing I want to mention here, it doesn't seem, it seems that after both Charles and David achieve their goals, people are kind of indifferent, or at least can we assume indifference from this 50-50? I don't know, but uh, at least they don't choose uh, David more than Charles. Uh, because uh, if you read the original paper, you would expect that people still would choose David more than Charles. But uh, here in my data, it doesn't seem to be uh, the case. So I don't know why that is, but I want to bring it up here. So again, people are, in this case, there's no zero, but they're sensitive to whether the actor achieves their goal. 
uh, and not so much to change the magnitude after that point. All right, so uh, the sensitivity happens primarily when you move uh, towards your goal, you achieve your goal, and then um, not much afterwards. Um, all right, I have two more studies and not enough time, I guess. So uh, I'll try to be fast because I like the final two studies quite a lot. Um, so one is in this intertemporal uh, decision domain. Um, and uh, this is a classic uh, temporal choice study. And it was run with uh, British participants. And uh, it's very similar design. Now you're familiar with my design. So always kind of the same idea, choice number one. Uh, people are choosing between 100 pounds now versus 110 pounds in a week from now. Choice number two, 100 pounds in a year from now, 110 pounds in a year in a week from now. Choice number three, 100 pounds in two years from now, and 110 pounds two years in one week from now. Choice number four, three years, basically, uh, uh, for both outcomes. So you see that as you move from choice number one to choice number four, uh, you're adding a year uh, to both outcomes. Uh, this is within participants. So it's the same people making all four choices in a random order. Um, and uh, presumably, Preference for A should be the highest in choice number one, right? Because in choice number one, you can get uh, this smaller outcome now, so you don't have to wait at all. Um, but uh, of course, as you add a constant uh, delay to both factors, to both options, uh, people should become increasingly more patient. We know that. So preference for A should decrease once you're adding uh, the need to wait. Uh, so preference for A should be the highest in choice number one and lower in choices two, three, and four. And presumably, uh, if people exhibit uh, diminishing sensitivity to time, we should see that choice of A is the highest in choice one and the lowest in choice four. So we should see a gradual decline in preference for A as you move uh, towards uh, the bottom part of the screen. Let's look at the data, choice number one. 20% uh, of the people choose A and 80% choose B. As you would expect, that drops in choice number two. So 10% of the people now choose A and 90% choose B. Uh, and there's not much difference with the other groups. Uh, so essentially, it seems again that people are largely uh, sensitive to the uh, whether they have to wait or not, and not so much uh, once we add this constant uh, delay of how much they need to wait. Um, so it's kind of the same type of experimental design and it gives kind of the same result across a different domain. That's the general point I want to make. Um, right, I have one more for you. Um, and uh, this is a study with moral choices. And that's the second paper that kind of sparked this idea in my head. Uh, I made the connection that uh, that's the paper by Berman and Cooper. Uh, Berman, uh, Jonathan Berman was here attending before he texted me that he had to leave, uh, but he will see the video. So I'm, I think he will. Uh, he'll be familiar with this. And um, in this study, people are presented with information about two proposals that are aimed to create formula to feed hungry families in Africa. And uh, we read this paper in our journal club here in Barcelona. And uh, that's shortly after I came up with this idea about this paper. Um, so in this experiment, uh, I use kind of the original stimuli from the authors. Uh, people make four choices in a random order. And uh, choice one, there are two proposals. Proposal A is to build one acre of farmland for an African village. And no trees will need to be cut down to create this farmland. And this farmland will provide enough food to feed hungry, uh, hungry families. Proposal B is to build five acres of farmland. Um, and a total of one acre of scarce tropical rainforest will uh, need to be cut down to create these five acres of farmland. And that uh, will feed 500 hungry families. Um, choice number two, proposal A is to build one acre of uh, farmland for an African village. But now, a total of one acre of scarce tropical rainforest trees will uh, need to be cut down to create this uh, farmland. Proposal B, now you have two acres of scarce tropical rainforest that need to be cut. So essentially, you add one acre of uh, rainforest trees that need to be cut to both options as you move from choice one and choice two. And these are the exact same stimuli that uh, appear in the original paper. In the original paper, they find that uh, people mostly prefer proposal A in choice one because uh, you can avoid harm, essentially. That's the point of the authors by choosing A in choice one. But once you cannot avoid harm anymore, like in choice two, people uh, want to maximize the benefits, so they choose uh, proposal B more than proposal A. Uh, so I took this design, and I added also two more uh, choices. So I add another one acre when you go to choice three. Uh, proposal A, you have to cut two acres of scarce tropical rainforest. 
and B, you have to cut three acres. And so it's number four, you have to cut uh, uh, for proposal A, three acres of scarce tropical uh, rainforest trees. And proposal B, you have to cut uh, four acres. So it's the same idea as before. And you're adding essentially one acre of uh, rainforest trees that you need to cut as you move from choice one to choice four. Um, and now the question is, do people become, um, uh, does preference for A drop uh, as you move from choice one to choice four? This is the design, it's the same uh, thing you've been seeing uh, all the time. Uh, presumably people would prefer proposal A more in choice one because you can avoid harm, you can avoid damage in the environment uh, by choosing A, but uh, people should become increasingly uh, indifferent between the options or uh, this difference between the two proposals should become uh, smaller or feel smaller as you go to choice number four. Uh, so proposal A should be chosen less in choice number four. Uh, and the point here is, do people actually uh, show diminishing sensitivity or they mostly react to the presence versus absence of harm and they're not very sensitive to changes between choice two, three, and four. Um, so let me show you the choices. So in choice number one, 41.8% uh, of the people choose A and 58% of the people choose B. Choice number two, as you would expect, 25% of the people choose uh, A and 74.5% of the people choose B. And that's kind of the same in the other two groups. So it doesn't seem to uh, get any more changes uh, in people's choices as you add more uh, uh, harm to the environment. So it's kind of the same results I've been showing you before. Uh, the same kind of pattern as essentially you're adding and moving further away from zero, uh, people don't seem to show much uh, difference in their choices across uh, different decisions. Okay, um, we don't have so much time. Yeah, Mina, go ahead. Hi, um, so I think this reminds me of our, our paper <laughs> together about indifference. So also Don just asked about, um, so this particular design, you compel forced choice, even when you expect people to be most indifferent between a pair of options. And he was wondering whether you tried a uh, continuous response scale and something whether you tested with same um, results using a continuous scale. Yeah, the only study I have a continuous scale is the one I showed before with the human lives, where I had this slider scale with zero to 100. Uh, and um, the only reason I did that was actually because it was the first study I ran. I was like, let me not run too many people because my budget was low at the time. I'm like, I'm going to run it with a rating scale, have presumably more power. Uh, but I have to say, after that point, um, I started learning everything with choice. So I don't have much experience if it matters. Uh, in that one study, I found evidence with a rating scale that was similar to the choice that I showed you. I see. Well, I, don't, I don't know if there are differences. I, I mean, I think that's also related to Jonathan Berman's question on the Q&A. So he said that, uh, people, you know, there are two possible uh, options. Is one, people don't seem to anticipate feelings, uh, diminishing sensitivity to outcomes. Uh, or second, that they do anticipate it, but it, does, uh, it doesn't affect their choice. Do you have a sense which one is the direction that you expect? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I think... Uh, first of all, I cannot answer it with my data, right? My data, I infer from the choices that people presumably, maybe they don't exhibit diminished sensitivity. And I think one of the reviewers actually at some point said, maybe they do experience diminished sensitivity, but it doesn't affect choice as much. Um, so uh, in any case, the conclusion could be that diminished sensitivity is not a major input into choice. Um, but on a perceptual level, it could be that people actually experience diminished sensitivity. It just doesn't. Drive choice with my data cannot actually answer that question well. So, and I would rather not speculate. I don't like speculating without data, unfortunately. Um, I'm not that, uh, I'm, I don't want to generalize too much. Um, uh, Oleg, you have a question. So, in all of the studies, were these all between subjects? Or uh, did some have people making repeated choices? It's half and half. So, this one that you see here is within. Uh, so, it's repeated choices. Uh, so, the product, the product choice was between. Uh, this is within, the intertemporal was within. Um, I have some financial choices within as well in the paper. Have you looked at heterogeneity for the studies where you have within? Um, have you looked at heterogeneity to see, is there a subgroup that is more sensitive to these changes in magnitude, but it's small, right? That's, or, a, that's or, a very, or, <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I haven't done that, uh, I have to say. But the data is publicly posted, so you can actually do it uh, if you're curious uh, or someone else in the audience. Uh, 
I just haven't done it. I didn't think about it. Uh, it didn't come up in the review. Uh, the paper was too long already, and I didn't want to. Uh, but it's a very good point, actually. There must be some heterogeneity, I presume. At least some people must show diminishing sensitivity. But and of course, now I'm talking about the majority, but I don't know what happens um, exactly in the data. Uh, Irene? Yes, so um, all the studies show some kind of choices between options that produce a psychological response. Have you ever tried choices between options that are like for which people should anticipate instead like a more a physiological response? And do you think you would observe a similar pattern? Uh, like, so kind of like psychophysics, basically. <laughs> like yeah, or pain or temperature or something for which maybe the experience of diminishing sensitivity is something people can relate a bit more to. Yeah, yeah. I, I would, if I had, I haven't done it, uh, clearly. I've only done choices because that's the only thing I know how to do. Uh, but if I had to do it, I would say that probably uh, you would find more evidence of diminishing sensitivity using uh, this design in a perceptual domain. Uh, so I'm sure if you run this design with uh, the weight study that Weber uh, devised, you would find evidence of diminishing sensitivity. Just that with choice, I think uh, it doesn't show up as much. Um, so uh, diminishing sensitivity for me, uh, the evidence uh, is much stronger in the psychophysics world because I think their design uh, has, even though it has the same features as the one that I'm showing you here, it has clear evidence for that. Um, but I haven't done it, no, sorry. I only know how to do choices. Um, that's my only uh, specialty. All right, um, um, let me summarize. Uh, what we had, uh, what we found in this paper. So I started going back to prospect theory and I said there are two ways to test for uh, diminished sensitivity and can give you different conclusions, even for the same outcome. Uh, in the interest of time, I don't wanna uh, 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 recapitulate on those. And um, what I wanna mention is that think about it every time you make a judgment about diminished sensitivity on a, based on an independent choice, on a single choice, uh, it could be that people exhibit diminishing sensitivity or not. And I think the diminishing sensitivity as an idea, as a concept, uh, merits uh, studies that have multiple conditions where you control for everything and you only manipulate the outcome that you want to study. Um, so uh, experiments that use the methodology that I showed you show that people are mostly sensitive to the presence versus absence of outcomes, not so much to the scope once the outcomes are always present. Uh, that was robust across various uh, domains. Uh, this finding also can explain uh, different things like the power of zero for prices and this um, uh, moral decision making uh, that uh, John uh, uncovered in his paper. They all can be traced to this kind of the same experimental design that people saw. Uh, scoping sensitivity as well kind of uses similar experimental designs. I discussed this in the paper. Um, so the question is here how much does diminishing sensitivity actually impact choice? And if you use this type of designs, it seems not, not so much. I mean, you could argue that there's this special zero with the discontinuity. And then like all excess, maybe some linear function is enough to model the rest. Um, so I put forth this uh, rapidly diminishing sensitivity, this function where people are mostly sensitive to the presence versus absence of outcomes. And then uh, uh, you, uh, the, uh, the value function quickly flattens out as you move away from zero. I wanna mention there is one more possibility. Uh, in some domains, it could be that people exhibit maybe something like a discrete sensitivity, it looks like that. So. Uh, the value function quite flattens out very fast directly after zero. And so as you saw in the study with uh, the moral decisions, you, the moment you had one acre versus two acres, uh, you could kind of had this insensitivity already. Uh, in the classic study of San Pagnier et al, um, people became insensitive. The moment you stepped away from a price of zero to one cent versus two cent, people became kind of insensitive to further changes. So in some domains, it could be that people become immediately insensitive. The moment you step away from zero and you go to one, uh, that can happen. I don't want to uh, make a big point that this could happen in all the cases. I don't think it happens, for example, decision making under risk. Uh, but it could be that in some cases you can find it, and maybe in those cases you can think about it more like a discrete type of sensitivity um, around zero. Um, so that's all I have to say. I know it was too heavy, maybe, for uh, uh, so late in the afternoon, especially if you're in Europe. I feel bad for uh, you. Uh, but thank you for joining my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to contact me, I have some some platforms. If you want to read the paper, it's on my webpage uh, and you don't have to pay anything, but uh, if you want to pay JP General, that's fine by me too. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining and for tuning in. And if you have a question, I'll check it later. Thanks. Thanks so much, Janice. That was really great, really engaging. And thanks to all of our panelists for all their great questions along the way. And final thanks to uh, all of our attendees who submitted a bunch of great questions. I'll make sure I get those to Janice.
So thanks everybody for being here today. We'll uh, do this all again next week. Enjoy your weekend.